The past two weeks, we started talking about graphs, specifically binary trees, and we used them to create some nice data structures, like a binary heap or a binary search tree. For the next three weeks, however, we are going to talk about graphs in and of themselves and see how we can design algorithms to analyze the structure and properties of graphs. There are five main problems about graphs that we're going to study in the next three weeks. The first that we will talk about today is about determining connectivity properties of graphs. To do this, we will talk about two classic methods for exploring a graph called depth-first search and breadth-first search. However, first I'm going to briefly describe all five of these problems to motivate the study of graph, al graph algorithms and show you what a rich and in interesting field it is. Imagine you are put inside the maze in this picture at the green dot, and you want to find your way to the red dot. To do this, you want to find a path in the maze graph from the green dot to the red dot. These are the kind of problems we will look at today determining if two vertices in a graph are connected, and finding a path between them if they are. Two methods we will see to do this are depth-first search and breadth-first search. Both have connections to finding your way out of a maze. Depth-first search is how you might explore a maze with a string and a piece of chalk, marking the passages you take and using the string to backtrack when you reach a dead end. And breadth-first search was first described in a paper from 1959, whose motivation was finding a shortest path out of a maze. Another venerable graph problem is to find a so-called minimum spanning tree. Algorithms for this problem were given as early as 1926 and used to construct efficient electricity networks. In the picture here, we have the Southern Cross Cable, a trans-Pacific network of cables. Now, laying this cable is extremely expensive. It costs around 50,000 US dollars per kilometer. So here comes in the minimum spanning tree problem. In this problem, we have a set of cities, let's say, that we want to connect by cables. We also have certain possible pathways between cities the cable can take. And each of these has an associated cost, say, based on the distance. The minimum spanning tree problem is then to find the minimum cost of laying cable that connects all of the cities. Next, we come to probably the most familiar of all graph problems, one that most of us solve every day. This is finding the shortest path between two locations. Shortest can mean anything here, the least amount of distance, time, or money. That's one advantage of using the abstract language of graphs. Edge weights can represent anything, and our shortest path algorithm can be applied independently of the meaning of, what it, of the edge weight. Now I want you to picture an enormous graph. This graph has a vertex for every configuration of a Rubik's cube. That's over 4.3 times 10 to the power 19 vertices. Two vertices in this graph are connected by an edge if they are related by a quarter turn or a half turn of one of the faces of the cube. So I've shown you a very small portion of this graph here with a solved cube on the right and some of the other configurations of the cube that are just a quarter turn away from a solved cube. Now solving a Rubik's cube is nothing more than finding a path in this graph from the starting state of your cube say the image on the far left, to the solve state on the right. And maybe you don't want to just solve the cube, but you want to find the shortest path to the solution in this graph. It was actually an open problem for a long time, how far apart two vertices could be in this graph. And this was solved just recently. It turns out that you can always go from one state of the cube to another in 20 moves or less in this what's called the half turn metric. So where two states are connected by an edge, if you can get from one to the other by turning one face a quarter turn or a half turn. So this will be a great example to keep in mind as we think about graph algorithms. Some graphs you definitely do not want to have to construct explicitly. Usually we think about edge weights as representing something non-negative like distance, time, or money. 
But negative edge weights can also be interesting. And here's an example of that. <clears throat> so here's some data from the Binance Cryptocurrency Exchange with the exchange rate between three coins, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Binance coin. This is a directed graph. So for example, on this day, one Bitcoin would get you about 13.8 Ethereum, and one Ethereum would get you about 0 0.072 Bitcoin. So there's a spread between the buy and the sell values. So these numbers are not exactly inverses of each other. Say that we would like to exploit differences in the markets between different coins to find arbitrage opportunities on Binance. For example, can we start with one Bitcoin, then change it to Ethereum, change that to Binance coin, and then change that back to Bitcoin, and end up with more than we started with? You see that the amount of Bitcoin we end up with if we were to do that is the product of the edge weights along this cycle from Bitcoin to Ethereum to Binance to Bitcoin. So in this case, it would be 13.8 times 7.267 times 0 0.00923. So what we are looking for is a cycle in this graph where the product of the edge weights along that cycle is greater than one. <clears throat> if we find that, then we can make money. Now, it's not actually very natural to look at the products of edge weights. That's not something we usually do with graphs. So what we're going to do is take the negative logarithm of the edge weights. And then we have the picture on the right. <clears throat> so once we take the negative logarithm, you see that now some of these edge weights actually become negative. And if you think about it for a little while, in this graph on the right, now the problem that we want to solve is we want to find a cycle where the sum of the edge weights on that cycle is negative. If we can find such a cycle, then that means that there's an arbitrage opportunity where we can make money. And this is actually a problem that we know how to solve. So we're going to talk about the Bellman-Ford algorithm, which can be used to find a negative weight cycle in a graph. So this algorithm could be used to look for arbitrage opportunities in markets. So I hope that these examples have shown you the rich variety of problems that graphs can represent and why graph algorithms is a fascinating topic. When we're talking about graphs, we should always be careful to specify what kind of graph we have. So edges can be directed or undirected, <clears throat> and they can be weighted or simply present or absent. And all four combinations are possible. And we've kind of seen examples of that here. So for example, the exchange rate graph was both weighted and directed. Um, if you just look at a street atlas, for example, that you, you might represent that as a unweighted and directed graph. Uh, streets can be one way. So there you would need edges to be directed. If you look at um, distance of, of flight connections, then probably you'd use an undirected graph because if you can fly from one city to, to, to another, usually you can go fly the other way. And we would want that to be weighted where the weight represents the distance between cities. And finally, we saw the example of the Rubik's cube graph where edges are naturally undirected and unweighted. So let's go over a little bit more about notation for all these kinds of graphs. So we think about a directed edge as an ordered pair of vertices. And I'm going to write that as an open parenthesis, I comma J, close parenthesis, to represent an edge that starts at I and is directed towards J, like in the picture here. An undirected edge <clears throat> is just a subset of two vertices. So I'm going to use set notation for that. So a curly bracket, uh, I comma J closed curly curly bracket, okay? And usually in a diagram, we'll just represent an undirected edge just by a line segment with, with no arrows, like in this picture. So now let's just think about an undirected graph and talk about some terminology for uh, relationships between vertices. So we're going to say that two vertices are adjacent 
if and only if there is an edge between them. I will also call adjacent vertices neighbors. So two vertices are neighbors, if and only if there is an edge between them. The endpoints of the edge, u, v, are simply the vertices u and v. And an edge is incident to a vertex v if v is one of its endpoints. And finally, the degree of a vertex is the number of edges incident to it. So let's go over these terms with a small example here. <clears throat> so here I have a graph on six vertices. And in general, when we have an n-vertex graph, I'm always going to identify the vertices with the numbers 0 through n minus 1. So in this graph, we see that vertex 2 and 4 are adjacent because they're connected by an edge. And vertex 1 and 5 are not adjacent. The degree of vertex 0 is 3 because there are three edges incident to vertex 0. OK, now let's go over some terminology for a directed graph. So for a directed graph, we have to be a bit more careful when we talk about an edge because we have to talk about the direction of that edge. So for a directed edge from u to v, we say that v is out adjacent to u and u is in adjacent to v. The out degree of a vertex is the number of edges directed out of it, and the in degree of a vertex is the number of edges directed into it. So in this small example here at the bottom left, the out degree of vertex 2 is 3, and the in degree is 1. Finally, for both undirected and directed graphs, when the graph is unweighted, we're going to represent the graph simply as a pair v comma e, where v denotes the set of vertices and e is the set of edges. When the graph is weighted, we need to additionally specify a weight function. So that is a function w, which is a mapping from the edges to the real numbers. And w of an edge gives the weight of that edge. With this notation out of the way, we are now going to move on to talk about how we can actually represent a graph in a data structure.